Hi, welcome to Tea Time in Olympia. I'm Lucas Miller, and my guest today is Justin Taylor, our 2016 Capital City Pride Award uh, Day winner uh, and longtime community activist. Um, Justin, hi, thank you for being on the show. Um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about uh, your background, how long you've been in Olympia, your pronouns if you want to share them, and you know what you, what you do here in the community. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lucas, for having me. I really appreciate being on the show, uh, especially after uh, you are now an award-winning show. <laughs> so uh, I think it was a great don't, introduction. Don't swell our heads anymore. It's it's getting out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, thank you for having me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Justin. Uh, I've been a longtime community member. I've born and raised for the most part here, um, and have been active uh, pretty much in the HIV/AIDS prevention arena for the last decade or so. And you work for the state. And, and, and I currently work for the state. Uh, and you asked me for my pronouns. I use he, him pronouns. Okay. Um, All right. And uh, so right now I'm actually a volunteer with the LGBTQ Employee Resource Business Group, uh, which started from the governor's directive. And okay. so there was an initiative set out to start an employee resource group mm. that would look at um, how to make it a better environment for LGBTQ employees while at the same time looking at best practices for LGBTQ customers and for the general public too. Because uh, part of that is doing a uh, public safe place um, uh, move in all our public facing offices. And so that okay. um, during the day, folks, if they're running to an issue uh, of a hate crime, that there's opportunities for them in our public facing offices uh, to seek emergency assistance. Um, so we're looking at, uh, at the state level as a volunteer how we can roll that out and how we're going to put forward a recommendation and kind of stakeholder it out. Um, and so I've been kind of helping uh, work with a lot of folks on those okay. issues that have been mm -hmm. set out by the governor's office. Uh, but uh, it's a little unfair of me to speak too much on it. I'm not a spokesperson for the group. Uh, there's a lot of wheels moving. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done and a lot more folks uh, we're talking to about how to do this best. Sure. So, But you've been in on the formation of that group pretty yes. much all the way along. Uh, so, pretty early, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, give us a little bit of background. Um, so, the, the, the group is for all state employees, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and, it's, and it's run through the governor's office. Yeah, it, it's a business and, resource group similar okay. to right. uh, some of the other kind of business groups that you might find at companies like Microsoft, and, and okay. we even have a few more in, in state government um, that mm -hmm. really look to uh, expand opportunities and at the same time uh, provide resources and, and make it a better working environment. But what's cool about it is not just mm -hmm. for staff. Right. Uh, it's for our, our customers, too, that utilize our services. So we're addressing different okay. needs as well. So okay. uh, kind of multi-focused. Okay, so it's so it's sort of a part customer service and part HR sort of. Yeah, I guess you could say you know? that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, give us give us an example of uh, like what sort of um, su suppose uh, an employee encountered a situation uh, where you know maybe they were being misgendered at work. Would, so, is that something that the yeah the so that uh, would... transitioning at work I think mm -hmm. uh, is probably going to be one of the bigger issues. It is so early on. We're actually okay. in the process of voting in our first chair. So ah, okay. uh, I've been uh, lucky enough uh, uh, to serve as interim chair to help okay. things get started. Right. Uh, Co-chair, I should say. And mm -hmm. uh, we're about a month away from actually voting in our first full chair uh, partnership for the group. Okay. Um, and right. so it, it's very early on and we're still kind of getting our, our feet below us and um, but part of it is going to be looking at best practices. So how do we look at how different state agencies and how different corporations are mm -hmm. adopting different uh, policies and best practices around LGBTQ plus issues mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so we can make it a better working environment for our staff uh, which ultimately will build happier employees that right. uh, uh, will serve the public even better. Uh, but also, how do we work with the public, uh, LGBTQ plus folks who are utilizing right. our services and making sure that we're adhering to um, a high caliber that uh, is expected of us yeah. as public servants? 
Okay. And that would include, I assume, things like um, trans competency trainings and... Oh, know, I hope maybe, so. I hope yeah, so. Yeah. Like I said, it's really early, but those are all things mm -hmm. that have been discussed. Um, nothing has been final, and ultimately, okay. um, this, this business resource group is not necessarily going to be the ones implementing it. It's okay. really a... Uh, a I hate to call it like a think tank, but it's a lot of folks coming right, together okay. to uh, uh, make recommendations on how to best solve these problems. Okay. Um, you mm -hmm. know, and it's uh, structurally, it's going to go beyond us, and it's going to be a lot of stakeholdering and a lot of uh, different groups and agencies that are going to be part of the implementation phase. Okay. And so I don't want to uh, take too much credit or say that it, it, it's a bigger yeah. thing yeah. Um, that we're making all these decisions. Um, I don't think it's quite fair to say that. but. Uh, some of the things you brought up around trans competency, I, I would hope personally, mm -hmm. uh, and that's all I can really speak to is my personal kind of two cents I've put in there, uh, right. that, that that's part of training and looking at uh, how do we mm -hmm. adopt uh, different best practices, specifically around trans issues, absolutely, because I think um, when we look at our community, even in the local area mm -hmm. uh, and at a national level, yeah. they tend to be issues that trail behind mm -hmm. the the pushes that I have seen at a national right, level, and, right. and so we have a lot of ground to make up. Yeah, but um, so this would be like a group that other state agencies would be able to draw on for ideas about how to make their particular offices, you know, friendlier places for their GLBTQ plus. Yeah, that's employees. that's one of the many goals that was outlined by the yeah. governor's uh, directive, sixteen eleven. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that, that is definitely part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, do you think uh, the group will have much involvement with, for example, uh, interpreting Washington's civil rights law as, as it applies to state employees? Um, I can't speak too much on that. And like I said, okay. it's unfair of me to, to be too much of a spokesperson on, on a lot of these issues because okay. they're still taking shape and, sure. and yeah. nothing is concrete yet. And we haven't had an opportunity to hear from, mm -hmm. from all our uh, stakeholders. Uh, okay. including the public. Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, I don't want to say too much because uh, mm -hmm. nothing is in stone right now other than uh, folks can reference the governor's initiative, 16, or directive 1611, okay. and he's outlined okay. several initiatives in there that uh, we're working off of as okay. a template. Hmm. Um, that's the only thing right now that I could say is, is concrete. Okay. So there will be an opportunity for public input about what, what the group Oh, yeah. Does. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, uh -huh. That's the goal. That's okay. the goal. So All right. we're still a ways uh, from that, though. So I, I would hate to yeah. say, yes, we're doing this. Yes, mm -hmm. we're doing that until, until it actually happens. Right. But the goal is to get it right. Okay. You know, if we're going to do these initiatives, uh, yeah. and it's, it's multifaceted on what bodies are working on them, but the goal is to do it right and do right by the citizens of Washington and at the same time do right by the, the state workers and the public servants that serve the state yeah. of Washington. Yeah. So. Um, you, in particular, work for L&I. Correct. So I assume that there will be representatives from a lot of different state agencies on this Yeah, body. and, they, and yeah. there are. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And I'm also not a representative of L&I either, so no, I'm, no, I'm here but, as a, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> personally. Right. So. Well, can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, what your experience uh, has been as, uh, as, a, as an openly gay person working in state government? You know, have you found it to be... Uh, a friendly, welcoming kind of environment, or yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I personally can can state that you know, mm -hmm. working inside state government, at least where I'm at, has been a very positive experience. Uh, I think any institution, uh, you know, there's always room for improvement. Yeah. You know, and so I keep oh, my yeah. eyes out, and I'm I'm fairly critical, um, but also the lens that I look through is going to be different than other folks. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's only so much I can say on on what it's like for everyone. But I know that uh, all the managers I've worked for personally, all the mm -hmm. uh, uh, leaders that I've seen, the goal is to uh, ensure that it's an employer of choice for all staff. So that yeah. it's a place they want to come to work, they enjoy working, because when you have happy staff, yeah. they're going to be yeah. better at customer service and serving the public. And yeah. so I know at, at a high level, that's the goal. Yeah. And it allows you to recruit the best people and keep them. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. If you have, have those yeah, so I mean, in, in place, turn, yeah. they benefit from that. Right. And they benefit exactly. from a lot of folks who identify as LGBTQ plus, mm -hmm. who uh, we tend to have some of the best and brightest in our community. Yeah. That yeah. you know are missing out. I mean, mm -hmm. any community you can say that. I'm not saying just about us, but you right. know, any sort of group of folks. If you are not tapping into that potential, then you're missing out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think state government realizes that. 
And I think a lot of corporations now are starting to come around and realize that. Yeah. Well, of course, we've been very lucky the last few years to have Jay Inslee as our governor who has, you know, been, you know, a really great ally to the GLBTQ community. Yeah, I you would know. agree with that. Yeah. And, um, you know, this, this directive in particular, you know, is... I'd, I'd say it's in line with, with many of the other things that he's done as governor. Yeah, know, my understanding that, is, yeah, you know, yeah. some of the initiatives outlined in that directive mm -hmm. um, are the first in the nation. Yeah. So I, I my understanding, and, and just speaking personally, is uh -huh. that, you know, he's at the forefront of a lot of these issues and pushing in a way that uh, I haven't seen from other governors. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have had quite a wide-ranging career in... in <laughs> in GLBTQ activism. Um, I know in particular uh, you've worked on uh, HIV and AIDS prevention and education um, with empowerment and PCAF and at the state level. Um, can you tell us a little bit about empowerment and what it does? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's some history there. Yeah. So I mean that's yeah. what I've been doing the longest um, and that's where my passion is. Okay. Um, when you look at uh, the numbers now, and, I, and just taking us kind of into modern day on what we're facing, you know, it's, it's a huge issue. Yeah. It's a huge issue facing our community. Um, it hasn't gone away. Right. Uh, this disease continues to yeah. impact uh, a grossly disproportionate amount of our community in a way that I think a lot of folks don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A new CDC report came out, and uh, for the first time they had projected HIV rates and they looked at different demographics. Uh, this right. was specifically on gay and bi men, mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. uh, is the kind of epidem right. uh, epidemiological right. uh, uh, kind of term. Sure. And um, I think it's one in, one in 11 mm -hmm. by the end of their lifetimes would be impacted right. by HIV and AIDS. You start breaking it out by different yeah. groups, that number gets even higher. Right. Um, uh, different cross sections of the community, uh, that number can grow as high as one in two. Yeah. Different yeah. subgroups, which is uh, unacceptable. Yeah. Um, and so, luckily, there's some new advances that we're taking advantage of uh, that seem for the first time uh, are not only kind of subduing the spread of the virus and, and keeping it fairly stable mm -hmm. as far as how many new infections we see every year, right? but um, are actually, for the first time in, in a couple decades, we're seeing a decline, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, Good. But yeah. I think your original question on how I got here right. uh, yeah. was my passion in looking at, mm -hmm. you know, why are folks in my community, folks that I identify with as a gay black man, mm -hmm. impacted so much by this virus, I right. need to educate myself on it, and what can I do personally yeah. to get the word out there mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's kind of a long story that got me here and so I can kind of go into that if you want sure yeah please um, so I've always wanted to be a filmmaker mm -hmm. I went to college for making films uh, and at that time you know grasping my identity as a gay black man mm -hmm. um, I knew of HIV I didn't know much about it other than you know I think there's a fear and yeah. I think that oh yeah you know with a lot of young folks mm -hmm. around that age or younger they might have heard about it, they don't know how much of an issue it is, and they don't really know right. exactly what's putting them at risk other mm -hmm. than they're demographically at risk, at a higher risk than other folks. Yeah. Um, but they don't know the scale of different risks and they don't know too much about the virus, what it does to your body, um, and all the different transmission methods. Right. Um, right. Uh, a lot of people can be overly fearful in ways that sure. uh, they couldn't get the virus, and then yeah. some you know, times there's ways that we're at risk and that we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the time, I knew I needed to educate myself, and I was a filmmaker in college, and so I decided to do a documentary. And so it took me to different community-based organizations here in Olympia that dealt yeah. with HIV AIDS patients, um, both in treatment, mm -hmm. case management, and also on the prevention side, what sort of educational programs they had that were out in the community here in right. Olympia or yeah. the Thurston County area. Uh, and I contrasted that in the documentary with um, different uh, CBOs, community-based organizations in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so I got my backpack on and a bunch of college gear, probably $10,000 worth of gear from the college, and went down to San Francisco and backpacked and kind of wow. interviewed different folks at different agencies on what they do and kind of self-educated myself through that documentary. Yeah. Um, it was the only way I think at the time I knew how. Now, when was this exactly? Uh, I would have been probably 19 or so. Oh, okay. So. 
you know, well over a decade ago, okay. uh, back right. in college, and right when I started um, over at Evergreen. Okay. So yeah. um, a little bit later, I uh, uh, was actually managing a television department, uh -huh. um, and uh, there was an opening at one of the community-based organizations that I had interviewed, and I knew a gentleman there yeah. that was part of their speakers program, okay. and he said there's a job opening up um, for their outreach program, and so I put my name in the hat to see if I could get it and they said ah, we don't know if we're hiring the program's pretty underutilized uh -huh. and I said okay well I'll check back in a week so I came back in a week and they said we still don't know so I think I checked back three or four times uh, <laughs> and at the time it was an organization called United Communities AIDS Network a lot yes. of folks know it as you can yeah and um, I put together a, a little business plan you know whatever mm -hmm. an 18 19 year old college kid can do um, <laughs> I actually, I was a little bit later, so I think I was 20, 21, okay. and I said, you know, I think, you know, it's underutilized, but I think there's opportunities here, and I think mm -hmm. it can grow into something substantial. Yeah. Um, they took a chance. They hired me. Part-time job became a full-time job, um, and through that time, I got to meet some fantastic volunteers that really helped elevate the program yeah. uh, to actually a national status. Uh, we won several awards at the national level, um, some of them around media, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, similar to this show, you yeah, know, uh, yeah, yeah. taking issues and really finding new ways of, of conveying messaging. It's great for the ego, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always want to put my volunteers out there. I actually, yeah, uh, yeah. this is pretty odd for me. I, as mm -hmm. a filmmaker, I like to be behind the camera, not in front of it. <laughs> and so it's, uh, yeah. it's a bit surreal right now. <laughs> so I always yeah. put the volunteers yeah. in front. Yeah. So, and they did a fantastic job and, and always amazed me. You know, mm -hmm. the biggest thing I can say, sorry, just for a second, is that, you know, uh, all of that hard work, you know, mm -hmm. I was paid staff. It was expected right. of me. Sure, yeah. But for the volunteers yeah. to show up on time yeah. and put in just as much work and effort as I have throughout yeah. the years without receiving a paycheck. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times putting in money when the nonprofit, you know, they, oh, I want food or snacks or, you know, they would go out and, and get it themselves for, for group meetings and things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we always didn't have the funds. I mean, that's that's dedication, and, and I think you find that in this community, and that's really what I agree. makes the nonprofit yeah. world in this community so great. People yeah. set out, fill vacancies and issues, and, and become leaders themselves. Being involved with several nonprofits in the area, I have certainly had cause to be very grateful for the dedication of, of all the volunteers who show up and, and put so much work and heart into it. Um, but I'd be interested to know, um, so what became of that documentary that you did as a student, and is it still available anywhere? Is it, can it still be? <laughs> well, like a lot of things I did yeah. in college, uh, my class has seen it. Um, you know, I want to say that I, I anticipated it being like 60 minutes, and I want to mm -hmm. say I got it to like 30 minutes, and you know, you move on to the next project in college, and it right. became a yeah. learning experience for me, both uh, okay. learning film, mm -hmm. but at the same time, or video, I should say, and also learning about uh, about this virus and how it impacts yeah. my community. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's, I was very young in college sure, and, and there's yeah. a lot of technical things with it that uh -huh. wouldn't make it a, a good watch right now. Okay. All right. But you were able to take the, what you learned about HIV and AIDS. Um, well, it helped and me build network us, connections yeah, and, yeah. and ultimately gave me a platform and a stage. I mean, it all kind mm -hmm. of started with my own curiosity there. Right. Um, and it, it built from there, and all of a sudden, an opportunity opened up. And I was networked in the right ways to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, there's nothing special about me other than I was in the right situation, you know, and I, and sure. I saw an opportunity, yeah. and I thought my mm -hmm. skill set uh, would lend itself to doing that type of work. And I, I yeah. took a chance on yeah. myself, and other people did too. And um, here I am. Well, so tell us a little bit more about, um, because I remember uh, back when uh, you can. Uh, was still um, was hosting the Olympia Men's Project, yeah. which sort of I guess morphed into what is now empowerment. Yeah, you know how nonprofits um, are. It's a long, yeah, kind yeah. of winding history. So I'm trying to yeah. think of how to kind of put it in a, a nutshell here. But yeah. uh, essentially, the Olympia Men's Project mm -hmm. um, was is the empower was the empowerment project. Right. So it used yeah. what was called the empowerment model. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so when I came in, I think it was still called Olympia Men's Project or OMP. Yes. Um, and yeah. it had deviated a bit from the original model mm -hmm. uh, that we were being funded for, yeah. uh, which was ultimately to do uh, uh, work in the community to reduce the spread of HIV AIDS among one of the highest hit populations, right. which was right. uh, gay, bi, and trans men. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, we looked at it and we said, you know what, 
let's get closer back to the CDC model mm -hmm. and see how that works. Since we had low, uh, um, and I had a lot of success too in the past, but at that yeah, time when I yeah. came in, it was in a bit of a lull and it was being underutilized. And so mm -hmm. we said, let's go yeah. back to the basics and get those right. Let's go back to the model. This right. is scientifically proven to work in different communities. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we should start. And so we took yeah. out extra things and just kind of got it down to that basic, we, we can't do the basics right, we can't do all this extra stuff. Yeah. Um, and we started seeing volunteers come in and get dedicated. And, and like I said, I mean, this was scientifically proven to work in mm -hmm. different communities. And so we wanted to go from there and, and along with kind of the dedication of the staff, because I wasn't the only staff person there, sure, uh, yeah. we were able to turn around the program. Yeah. So um, tell us a little more about that empowerment model. What does that involve? Because I remember when I was, during the brief time that I was with uh, OMP, um, there was a big emphasis on community building among young gay and bi-identified men and, and men who had sex with men, um, especially among younger ages. Um, you know, 18 to 30, I think, was the yep. age group that we were originally mandated to work with. Um, and there was, there was heavy emphasis on um, teaching young men how to communicate with each other about and how to negotiate safety in sexual situations. Correct. So, I, I think that's yeah. pretty spot on. I mean, yeah. it was uh, a multifaceted approach mm -hmm. that ultimately the goal uh, was to reduce um, uh, instances of HIV in this population, mm -hmm. which yeah. meant that we had to reduce risk um, right. and risky behaviors. Yes. And so the riskiest behavior we knew at the time, and, and we know now uh, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, particularly gay, bi, and trans men is unprotected anal sex. Right. Um, biologically, I can go into details, but, you know, um, that is yeah. the highest well, risk. And, and so we wanted yeah. to reduce the spread of HIV, and we knew that was the primary transmission method when we looked at the data. Mm -hmm. And so we had to look at behaviors around that. And part of it was negotiation. Part of it was yeah. informal cultural yeah. change. So how do we end? We did that through community building. Having social events wasn't just to have a social event so folks could meet friends. Right. Uh, it was ultimately to build communication models. And it yes. was able to, to allow folks to practice uh, uh, having some of those hard conversations with each other right. to support each other as friends, to support each other exactly. as uh, intimate partners. Right, because it's not enough just to provide the safer sex materials. You have to teach people you know, yeah. how to utilize them, not just practically, but socially and culturally and emotionally. Yeah, you yeah. know, and, it, and it, it, a lot of folks built friendships around it, and so I hate trying to put it back into a clinical setting because it meant a lot yeah. more than folks than just what the yeah. kind of yeah. science of the behavior change that needed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it was a community program, yeah. but really that was the wrapper. You know, that was the outward facing, what was happening kind of inside on a more intimate level with all the folks that were involved in the volunteers mm -hmm. was kind of a culture shift. And that was kind of the goal in the community is to get folks in yeah. and through a combination of informal and uh, more uh, kind of typical educational workshops and things right. that were two to three hour kind of things through events, through reinforcement mm -hmm. uh, of mm -hmm. messaging around safer sex. Right. Um, you know, it, it was kind of multifaceted to ultimately achieve a reduction in HIV rates among this population, yeah. and that knowledge hopefully would kind of spread out from some of these folks that were involved in the program, and it would create a new kind of normal around communicating, right. about getting tested, about utilizing different safer sex approaches and tools to hopefully get folks reducing uh, uh, themselves on a spectrum of risk. And so they mm -hmm. knew the risk, right. and they could take control of their own health decisions. You know, we never went yeah. out and said, you yeah. should do this, you should do that. Right. You know, it was all about, do you understand the risk? And can we give you the knowledge to take control of your own health mm -hmm. so that you can make decisions on your risk? So you know right. going into a situation, I actively choose to take this risk. I know what the risk is. Yes. That was my biggest thing in push. Yeah. It was not yeah. about preaching or telling people how they should do one thing or another thing like I knew everything. Right. It was more about... Because that's not really very effective, is it? <laughs> I don't know much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, it was all about, you know, understanding risks for yourself so you mm. can take charge of your health. Yeah. Uh, and so that you're not doing any guesswork uh, and, and you're consciously active in your own sexual wellness. Yeah. Yeah, and of course that was um, back before we had 
some of the other resources that we have now, such as PrEP and PEP. Yeah, and um, so yeah, PEP, PEP's so. been around for a while, um, so, and, and that's a really important thing I just want to put out there. Yeah. If uh, there's an issue where uh, you've been exposed, uh, mm -hmm. either through, you know, a, a condom breaking or right. uh, a situation where you may have been a victim, uh, a sexual victim, mm -hmm. then uh, PEP is available to you uh, going to the emergency room and letting them know within 72 hours, the sooner the better from that possible exposure. Right. Uh, and that's a known exposure, and they put you on a 28-day dosage of essentially uh, HIV meds that right. would reduce the likelihood of your body mm -hmm. uh, contracting the virus. Okay. Uh, not a lot of folks know that. That's why I always try and put it out there. And there are programs that actually pay for that medication, so you're mm -hmm. not out of pocket uh, when you go there, especially if you are a, a sexual assault victim. Okay. Um, and just for our audiences who may not know, um, PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Or a PrEP and is pre-exposure, PEP, PEP is post-exposure. It's post-exposure prophylaxis. Correct. And that's basically, um, it's a drug. Yes, a called, drug you can take. Um, and I'm not too sure of the, the regiment for PEP. Mm -hmm. uh, now, PrEP uh, is a new, it's not quite a new drug, but it's a new utilization of the drug. So the FDC, okay. uh, or FDA, approved it for mm -hmm. use for um, uh, pre-exposure. Uh, of HIV to reduce the likelihood of, of you contracting HIV if this medication is in your system. It's essentially the same sort of uh, treatment that we'd use if somebody was HIV positive, one of the, the regimens we'd use. Mm -hmm. um, but they saw a benefit uh, in it actually reducing uh, the spread of the virus, not just treating it. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And so part of my work uh, over the years uh, I served on the HIV prevention planning group, which yeah. was essentially a council at the state level where at the time I didn't work for the state. I worked for uh, uh, United Communities AIDS Network, mm -hmm. um, and they brought in different kind of community organizers to talk about how they can kind of shift the tide on this virus because although there's a lot of good work that was happening, especially in the educational world, right. um, we saw the numbers plateauing. Uh, mm -hmm. over the last decade or more. Yeah. And we realized that without any sort of substantial change in how mm -hmm. we did business, yeah. on how we addressed the issue, right. um, they were going to continue and more people, especially in, in our LGBTQ plus communities, would continue to contract the virus at, at these very high rates. Um, yeah. And so it, it was tough because, you know, there were new drugs coming out that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we looked at a little bit at the time, like this could be a, a miracle drug. Mm -hmm. um, you and I, and I'm being a little too bombastic there, but uh, you know we were cautionary. But um, we didn't have all the the knowledge we had now about it. Mm -hmm. um, and right. I was probably one of the biggest critics at that level that said, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, we we had a finite amount of money. Yeah. And so that required us to make some several big changes that were fairly controversial that uh, I'll be honest, I wasn't too sure how that was going to work. Right. Um, because there was a push for PrEP to be released, but mm -hmm. at the same mm -hmm. time, we looked at how funding was allocated, and we realized in order to do that, we had to make some substantial changes on how we funded HIV education right. at, in Washington State. Yeah. Uh, and so that meant uh, eliminating a lot of these education programs in yeah. some fairly big counties um, in order to fund different types of activities that we are hoping would work. Um, and so pulling back on education and then pushing out a new drug to folks and hoping that they were right. educated enough to take it and take it consistently. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just on a side note, as Americans, we tend to be the worst at taking medications consistently, and this drug required a fairly high adherence rate mm -hmm. for it to be uh, as effective yeah. as some of the initial studies showed. Yeah. Uh, and so... Um, it, it was some, some difficult conversations that we had at that level. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, that meant uh, in the direction we were going that programs like Empowerment in outlying areas outside of uh, some of the bigger metropolitan areas in, in Washington State right. would yeah. be defunded. Mm. So that meant yeah. programs that uh, were doing good yeah. work like Empowerment, and there were several other ones across the state in smaller counties that didn't really have a place to get tested, that didn't have a place to get this sort of education without driving to Seattle or, to, or Tacoma, mm -hmm. um, they would not be receiving funding to do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, and in Olympia, that meant defunding testing. 
So nobody can right. get free testing anymore yeah. uh, through, through our program. And so uh, for me that was devastating because I knew how impactful our program was and I knew there were a lot of smaller counties that mm -hmm. weren't considered you know, larger metropolitan areas that funding would dry up on the hope that this drug would make a substantial difference. Right. Um, right. You know, we couldn't necessarily do both. Um, mm. Luckily, yeah. I'm looking back and I was wrong. Yeah. You know, this drug has had a substantial impact, and for the first time in the last 15 years or so, we've seen yeah. a decline in HIV rates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I continue to have an ethical and moral kind of dilemma with it yeah. that, you know, I want to make sure that folks know fully what they're getting into uh, with PrEP. Right. I yeah. think it is a fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, just like condoms, uh, they are yeah. very effective but you don't want to overestimate uh, mm -hmm. their effectiveness. Yeah. That being yeah. said, statistically, uh, as far as people contracting the virus on this drug, uh, it's very low. It's very low. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't, we, at that time, we hadn't seen it in the wild. We didn't yeah. know. And yeah. all the studies at the time were folks who um, were on the drug and the recommendation was to use condoms at the same time. Right. And that's kind of how the studies were. Out in the wild, we know that that's not exactly how people are going to use it, just yeah. to be frank. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Right. Um, you know, what I didn't anticipate is also is, is a lot of stigma around folks using PrEP, mm -hmm. uh, which I hate to see. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think in this community, there are a lot of things that uh, uh, we, we get wrong sometimes. And... In this instance, uh, shaming each other, I think, is one we're really on the wrong side of, of how this should happen. Mm -hmm. um, folks on PrEP are taking uh, an active decision in their health, mm -hmm. and a lot of folks, mm -hmm. from what I know, are very educated on how to take it and do adhere to it. Um, and they also are required to have a three-month checkup with their doctor and do right. STI screenings, right. STD screenings. Um, you know, and so uh, hopefully that goes away and the stigma goes away. There's enough stigma already in our yeah. community around other issues that hopefully folks actively taking a choice right. to protect themselves. Right. Yeah. In this instance, yeah. you know, with a drug, mm -hmm. uh, that they're not uh, stigmatized for it. Well, of course, you know, I was, I was a high schooler back when the AIDS pandemic began in the early 80s. And as I recall, there was, there was a lot of, of stigmatization around condom use at that time as well, um, you know, especially in the gay male community, you know, there was there was a lot of resistance to the idea, you know, which which just carrying condoms on you, yeah, and, and we yeah. still see that a little bit yeah. today. You know, yeah. why do you have condoms on you? Yeah, you know, and it, yep. it's you know, it's a tool, and, and exactly. preps a tool. Yes, um, you know, and the goal, I think, you know, health officials, I, mm -hmm. I you know. Um, would hope that folks, you know, use PrEP in, in tandem with condoms. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, in the wild, we're not seeing that so much. Right. Um, yeah. But it seems to be pretty effective. You know, the, my fear is that, you know, somebody thinks it's more effective than it is and uh, contracts the virus while on the medication. I think that's the biggest fear uh, yeah. that I had yeah. back then and I still have now. Sure. Um, you know, it's not foolproof, <laughs> but uh, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty darn effective. And it's, and it's becoming more available. It's becoming more available, and uh, organizations like Pierce County AIDS Foundation, who mm -hmm. now actually took over services for UCAN in Olympia. Yeah. Um, so they serve, uh, quick plug for PCAF, they serve Tacoma, Pierce County, uh, Thurston County, uh, Mason, and, uh, Mason County, and, and uh, Lewis County. Mm -hmm. um, uh, providing vital case management services and also prevention work in there. But they have information that you can get to educate your doctor on PrEP right. if right. your doctor doesn't know much. And what we've found, too, is that a lot of doctors don't know much about PrEP, especially general providers. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little fact sheet that they can bring that kind of educate doctors so they feel a little bit more comfortable uh, prescribing it. Yeah. Well, there's been a fairly long-term partnership between PCAF and Empowerment. Um, yeah, and on, on an informal basis, yeah. uh, we don't represent them, they don't represent us, um, but uh, we have a history. So right, when PCAF right. took over services for United Community AIDS Network, UCAN, mm -hmm. um, Empowerment was a program they carried forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Empowerment program was actually administered by PCAF. I was the program director and they oversaw it. Um, yeah. And so they were our umbrella agency. Yeah. Um, 
uh, when uh, a funding decision changed at the state level, part of the HPPG, the HIV Prevention Planning Group I was a part of, mm -hmm. made the decision to kind of defund some of these outlying counties right. and ultimately fund um, higher prevalent areas like metropolitan areas and really yeah. focus money into those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we saw the empowerment program lose its funding. Um, yeah. But we worked with PCAF and, and really a huge testament to this local community. Yeah. When they found out that testing was going to be gone, this community rallied together and raised, I want to say, upwards of $22,000, $23,000 in a single night. Yeah. Um, that was then subsequently donated to Pierce County AIDS Foundation so they can have funding, continue doing free no-cost testing yeah. uh, here in, in the Olympia area. That, uh, that was back in 2013, and they continue to... Um, I think I'm sure that money's gone by now, but it allowed them yeah. to have the wiggle room and the time to figure out alternative funding opportunities right. Right. to continue testing here. I think I was at that fundraising gala. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you were. Yes, you yeah. were. Yeah. I think I think it was uh, it was the night after Pride. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It I was think definitely it, yeah. early summer. I yeah. seem to recall that, that a bunch of us came in having just got done breaking down. You look weathered. Everything from Pride. And, yeah. <laughs> I, we we were and a little concerned they wouldn't myself. let us in because we we smelled pretty rank at that point. But uh, oh, I did too. Yeah, I, we were tabling I, and doing yeah. separate pride, and <laughs> yes. it was hot. And then yeah, yeah it was even hotter yeah. in that ballroom. So yeah, but, but uh, that's but, just a yeah. testament to this community. Mm -hmm. I, I I continue to be floored by how much support because I went out yeah. and and told people what was happening, and people responded in a big big way. And um, you know, our our biggest donor yeah. was was the local union group, uh, local four four three that came through with a substantial donation and said that not only does this impact our members, yeah. these services, yeah. but they impact our members' families and their mm -hmm. kids yeah. and, and this ultimately this community and we're one family. Yeah. You know, and that's that yeah. was really the argument for the union to step up and, and put some substantial money to, to help support that event. Yeah. Uh, and I hopefully uh, uh, they understand it had a big impact and to this day, uh, you know, the the benefits from supporting us and supporting right. testing in here in this county have uh, made a big impact on folks' lives. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I uh, seem to recall that one of the things that Empowerment has done um, more recently is um, holding uh, workshops on PrEP and PEP and how they're, you know, what they are, how they're used, how they're made available, uh, yeah. as well as, you know, some of the more traditional safer sex uh, workshops you know, that teach people, you know, how to use condoms, how to Yeah, and I guess negotiate. I forgot the other half of the yeah. story, but yeah. uh, so when Empowerment was defunded, um, mm -hmm. folks in the community, we got together and decided to actually reform it as its own nonprofit. Yeah. And yeah. so um, that has been tremendous. We're much smaller now, but mm -hmm. yeah, we continue mm -hmm. to have workshops and we try and do, uh, op have opportunities to go out and still talk to folks that HIV is still an issue, get safer sex kits out, which uh, have condoms in there. Um, in appealing marketing that yeah. promotes testing uh, in different uh, locations in Olympia, and we're hoping to get to more sites yeah. uh, and be able to have enough money to fund even more condoms to diff these different locations. Yeah. Um, yeah. We promote the testing that PCAF still does today in Olympia. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, right now I would say that it's utilized, but they have room for more folks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are sexually active and you're in the LGBTQ plus population, you should be getting tested every six months at least mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're sexually active. Um, yeah. And you should be talking to your partners, starting a new relationship. It's a great time to go down and get tested. Yeah. Uh, start that conversation early so uh, there's, no, there's no guessing on, on your status when mm -hmm. you're entering into a relationship and folks yeah. don't have to guess about theirs. Yeah, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll find some information about free testing and where and when it's available. Um, but uh, to backtrack just a little bit, um, you mentioned there were some new studies that came out um, concerning uh, the spread of HIV and AIDS in, yeah. in different segments of the community. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that um, the, the statistics for um, the spread in the transgender community uh, are still a little uncertain. Yeah, so... Um, um, I think what everyone can agree on is that they're high. Yeah. They're too high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The rates are, it, it's a it's smaller representative population in a lot of the studies I've seen mm -hmm. uh, yeah. than when they look uh, at gay and bi uh, men. Right. Well, part of the problem is that uh, for a long time, um, 
trans people were sort of being lumped in with, you know, trans women were being counted as gay men. Yeah. You know, so that made it difficult to separate out, you know, prevalence among trans women specifically, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, trans men were being categorized largely as lesbians, even if they were, in fact, having sex with men. Yeah, yeah. So, and so you the know, data was, was always yeah, hard to kind of right. extrapolate. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily know those numbers off the top of my head. Neither do I, but um, I know there's been some. There's been uh, there's been a, a push among trans people to collect better data, and to provide better services specifically aimed at the trans population. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely yeah. vital yeah. because you know. It, one thing in, in all the stuff that I've done, and I've sat in a lot of meetings mm -hmm. over the years, yeah. and folks will say, well, it's a small population, and we really need to focus on the majority. And what that means uh -huh. is you don't matter enough. At least that's what I hear. When I look and they say, right. well, black yeah. gay men are not utilizing services as much, and so let's not put any more money in it. And I go, that's the exact opposite right. that you should be doing yeah. you're doing it wrong then yes. if you are providing services and folks aren't showing up then you got to find a different avenue to tell folks about those services not every community yeah. is going to respond in the exact same way or you need to find out why they're not utilizing those services oh exactly. what is it that's keeping them away yeah and a lot you of know? times you know what they'll do yeah. is say you know you know we got this pot of money and we're going to treat everyone the same and then those right. folks aren't accessing the services and so yeah. you know and this was Ten years ago now, sure. So yeah. I'm sure it's changed. But yeah. at the time, yeah. I sat in meetings, and you know, um, it 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 was very disheartening to see because I I literally was in a meeting, and a lot of times there were community folks. I mean, they weren't necessarily health officials, right? Um, but they said, you know, we really got to focus here because those they're not really using the services over here. Mm -hmm. They're a smaller population. Let's figure yeah. out this big piece. Yeah over here first and that meant that a lot of folks went out services even though the rates were substantially higher right the overall number might have been lower so there wasn't as much money into it exactly uh, and i think yeah. that's been the case for trans folks for a long time and, and continues to be and the particularly case. trans folks of color oh, you know, wow. who are even in smaller population and you know whose rates are proportionally even higher yeah yeah, yeah. And, and the rates across the board are, are yeah. way too high and, and yeah. there needs to be a holistic solution for every population to address this, or it's gonna be another 30 plus years and we're still gonna be having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well let's move on. Um, so uh, you are our uh, 2016 uh, Capital City Pride Award Day recipient. Um, tell, us about, tell us about that experience. Yeah, it, it was humbling, um, you know, I, I <laughs> Like I said, I'm, I'm not an out in front person as much uh -huh. as people probably see me everywhere and now doing stuff and, and yeah. stuff like this. Yeah. Um, I'm a really behind the scenes person and I would like mm -hmm. to consider myself just a hard worker and I see a cause and I try and offer my skill set when I can. Um, and, you know, it's nice to be honored by it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, first thing my mind goes to, and I'm not just saying this to, to look good on camera, but, you know, I think about all the people who helped me get here and all the folks that helped uh, uh, support the programs and the endeavors that I was passionate about. Right. You know, I was passionate about it, so I went out and did something. Mm -hmm. And other people came on board and said, I'm going to help you in yeah. this. Yeah. And I'm also passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Who didn't get any credit? You know, mm -hmm. there are hundreds yeah. of folks that propped yeah. me up and supported me and, and did a lot of the heavy lifting. And, and I'm lucky enough to be the one talking about it. Right. And hopefully I'm, I'm doing a decent job doing that for them. <laughs> yes. uh, but I'd be absolutely remiss not to think of all the folks that put in hard work every day who, who don't get thanked and who mm -hmm. don't uh, yeah. get awards, um, right. you know. And so it, yeah. it, it was nice, you know, it was nice being in the parade and my partner and I and our little dog were able to yeah. wave to folks, which was, you know, not ever, anything I ever thought uh, I would be doing as, right. you know, 15 coming out as, as a gay black, sure. you know, boy in Thurston County that, you know, I yeah. would be, um, uh, a voice of uh, for some folks and on some of these issues. You know, yeah. I never thought that. Yeah. So it, it, it was humbling and uh, very proud to accept the award. And mm -hmm. um, I, I want to think back to what I said at, uh, on stage. Um, you know, I really wanted to focus on, on the fact that, you know, I don't think there was anything I stepped up into that I was a perfect candidate for. 
that I was a perfect person to, to lead anything. Um, I saw a vacancy and I was mm -hmm. passionate about it and I stepped yeah. in because yeah. I didn't see anyone else stepping in. Right. Um, and well, sometimes a, that's what makes the perfect leader is just they step in where they see the need. Exactly. And I, yeah. and I think that a lot of folks look at something and say, yeah, I'm passionate about it. Yeah, there's a vacancy, but yeah. I don't, I have nine out of 10 of the skills there. I don't have that one skill set, you mm -hmm. know, and, and they don't give themselves a chance. And there's so many right. leaders out there yeah. that, uh, uh, would be fantastic at these different roles and jobs, yeah. but they don't want to put themselves out there because they're scared to fail. But okay. most of the time, what mm. I've seen when folks step up, they knock it out of the park yeah. every single time. They have the yeah. skills, but you know, for whatever reason, they don't give themselves credit. And I think part of being in the LGBTQ plus different communities here mm -hmm. is yeah. that you know, sometimes it's harder, and I can only speak for myself, to yeah. have that confidence because you don't see yourself reflected a lot. Sure. You yeah, know, yeah. I don't see necessarily folks who look like me reflected in leadership that mm -hmm. often. Yeah. And there's yeah. other groups who, who rarely see folks who look like them reflected in, in media or leadership positions. Right. And so I think that has, takes a toll on our confidence to, to see ourselves in those positions. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I've, I've really wanted to push folks mm -hmm. who, you know, whenever I'm talking that, you know, there are opportunities and there are opportunities where if you're yeah. not the one to step yeah. up, then it's not going to get done. Yeah. What do you see as some of the things we can do to increase that confidence and, and cultivate leadership in, in some of the communities that don't often, you know, see themselves as leaders? Well, I think, one, we need to be more vocal. Mm -hmm. So we need to acknowledge the problem that we have with representation because yeah. it's not that we don't have good folks. Yeah. That's never been the issue. No, across the board throughout history. And, Certainly and not in my experience. We have a lot of talent out there. We just need to figure out how to how to tap how into to cultivate it. it. Yeah. You know, the second thing is is really being uh, uh, out there and and if it's political, voting for the folks that you want to see represent you. Mm -hmm. Going out and canvassing for them. Yeah. You know, if you are privileged to have the money, donate money to different campaigns that reflect your ideals and your values. Yeah. You know, I, I also put out there, there's no such thing as a perfect candidate, mm -hmm. but I think it's important that we, we get folks out there that can represent us uh, the best way possible and, and reflect, you know, each other. Yeah. And on what we want to see. And I think, you know, that alone, I think is going to have a huge impact mm -hmm. on folks feeling confident and seeing right. themselves out there, yeah. you know. And we got to support each other. We have to be able to go out and and really not just throw people out there and say, I voted for you, or I really had confidence in you, or I'm a really good cheerleader for you, but to have continual support because we know right. that any leader, no matter mm -hmm. where they're at, yeah. is only as good as one person. Yeah. It takes a village to solve these complicated problems, problems that we haven't been able to solve in generations. Yeah. It is not going to be solved by one person alone. Right. And so we can't expect that of our leaders either. Yeah. We have to be able to be alongside with them for that journey if yeah. we actually hope to create change. Preferably from change. the time that they're that they're youth. Oh. You know, from yeah. yeah. And and the work you're doing I think is instrumental and in actually well, you're yeah. building that confidence with youth when you go out and talk on behalf of Pizza Clatch. Yeah, I mean that's that's really one of the things we try to do is not just foster resiliency but but you know, encourage people to you know, encourage young people to step into those leadership roles. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's going to be especially uh, important, uh, you know, especially for the, for the future of, of HIV and AIDS prevention. Um, you know, working with young people, you know, teaching them those, giving them that knowledge and teaching them those skills early on is, is probably going to be maybe the biggest preventative factor. Oh, yeah. You know, you know and... For, and not right. just for HIV, but for suicide, drug use, you know, all kinds of other ills. We have a lot of that, problems to yeah, solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we got marriage, but, you know, that was the tip of the iceberg, and now we got, yeah, we got the rest of the iceberg. We got the problem we have to yeah, solve. There's a lot of issues that, you know, honestly, maybe should have come first. People will argue. I, um, yeah, you know. I, I kind of think so, but, <laughs> but then I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to marriage. Everybody knows. <laughs> oh, and I, and uh, my partner and I are planning to get married later. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, later next year but mm -hmm. um and that's that's all great we needed those rights but yeah. you know i i think what i've seen is a lot of uh, uh lost interest mm -hmm. you know there was a huge push for marriage and now that well that's i think passed, we over invested really in that one issue 
as it know, being the, the be all be, end all. But yeah, really, that we got to look no. at that as a tip of the iceberg and really start yeah. solving these huge issues. There's no reason why our, our teens who identify as LGBTQ plus uh, w need to be in situations where they feel like the only solution is taking their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. At, at the rates that we're seeing, it mm -hmm. is absolutely ridiculous. And and part of that is, you know, that's a whole other yeah. topic. I mean, part of that's national and yeah. some of the way yeah. things are happening and how folks are are being treated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not great right now, but in a time like this, especially now, we need to come together as a community, regardless of our or regardless of our differences. Yeah, and absolutely. figure out how to bridge these divides and make ourselves a bigger tent so that we can solve these issues together. Yeah. Um, anything else about your experience uh, as an activist in the GLBTQ community? Uh, any final message for our viewers that you'd like to that you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I'd keep it simple. Step up for leadership. Get tested. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Justin Taylor, for being with us today. Our uh, 2016 Capital City Pride Day Award winner uh, and just all around world saver. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's been a pleasure and, and thank you for having yes. me on the show. So, thank you and very working much. with you too. Yes. Because we, we work together a lot. Can I look at we work together yes, a lot. We, it's true. We're so. both. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's like me. Can't say no. <laughs> I'm learning though. I'm yes. learning. All right. Well, thank you very much for being with us on Tea Time. This is Lucas Miller. Have a good night. Thank you.